Hi, this is Steve Fryett, and welcome to our modeling workshop. What we're going to be doing here is we're going to be putting all of the popular modeling products through their respective paces, and uh, we're going to be connecting them to our new LX2 stereo power amp, and we're using a BGW stereo solid state power amp as a reference amplifier. And um, we're primarily going to be discussing power amp behavior, speaker response, harmonic balance, and playing dynamics. In uh, subsequent installments, we're going to be putting a Kemper profiling amplifier and a Pod Pro HD through their respective paces. So that's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, the, today, we have an Avid 11 rack, which was kindly provided to us by our buddy Cameron Meadows at Avid. Thank you very much. And um, we as I said, have it connected to the LX2 and the BGW250 and into a Deliverance 412 cab with P50 speakers. The LX2 is 40 watts per channel with 6L6s and delivers that power into 4, 8, or 16 ohm loads. Uh, it also has a bridge mono mode, in which case it will deliver 80 to 85 watts RMS into 2, 4, or 8 ohms. It also has a switch which provides a FR, FR, that's full range flat response mode, and an enhanced mode, which is similar to the coloring that you would expect from the 252 or 292. Uh, coloring in the sense that it actually extends the activity of the presence and depth controls on the 252 and 292. In this case, it just emulates some of the character of our other power amps. Uh, for the for the uh, purpose of enhancing the performance using um, a tube preamp, uh, a slaved head, or some other signal source where you want to get a little bit of uh, sonic enhancement. What we're going to end up uh, showing you is, even though the modeling companies tend to recommend a flat power amp and uh, a neutral frequency uh, response curve, uh, once you see how effective the uh, enhanced switch is at um, bringing out some of the finer qualities of the models in the modeling units, uh, my guess is that you're going to be highly tempted to experiment with that a lot. And it's going to come in very handy during live performance uh, situations. Okay, so um, I think I've pretty much covered it pretty well. Um, as I said, the LX2 is uh, able to operate in bridge mono mode, and that's how we have it set up today. The BGW is 150 watts a side into 4 ohms, and when you run it bridge mono, that's about 300 watts. And uh, we have the cabinet set at 4 ohms. The reason that we have this all set up at 4 ohms is because at the 4 ohm load, we get the best damping factor and uh, the lowest operating impedance. We're trying to get a sort of a comparable level playing field between the two because we don't, what we're trying to do is get an objective uh, comparison between a really high quality tube power amp and a really high quality solid state power amp. Damping factor and low impedance are very important. They work together. Uh, an amp with very low impedance generally has a high damping factor. Damping factor is the ability of the power amplifier to control the excursion of the speaker cones when you hit them with signal. Uh, the uh, uh, higher the damping factor, the more control of the speakers. The lower the damping factor, the less control of the speakers. Tube power amps typically have a lower damping factor than solid state power amps because of just the inherent nature of the design. So when you listen to a tube power amplifier and you say it's coloring the sound, well, some of them out there may. Um, Fryett power amplifiers generally are known to be not real big coloration machines. And uh, the reason for that is we're trying to keep it true to the uh, program material that you're putting into it. So um, when you're plugging into a speaker cabinet, you want to have a certain amount of interplay between the speaker and the amplifier to get that realistic dynamic feel and punch. Uh, a solid state power amp will tend to suppress that a little too much and make it sound like a sterile stiff performance. And that actually will show you how that actually makes it a little harder to play the guitar. Um, some of the new solid state power amplifiers, and this is a pretty old one, but it's, it's similar to new ones in that 
it's neutral and it has a very high damping factor. Some of the newer ones actually have a lower damping factor. They're trying to emulate tube performance more and that's how they do it, by lowering the damping factor. That allows the speaker to interact with them more to accomplish the supposed tubey characteristic. It isn't really a tubey characteristic, it's just a little bit more interaction, which is nice and it helps, but it doesn't really take the place of the way a tube amplifier behaves in a lot of ways, especially in how they develop harmonics. A solid state power amplifier, if it gets into the distortion region, develops some pretty ugly sounding harmonics. A tube power amplifier, when you overload it, it generates very pleasing harmonics. And although we're trying to stay out of the distortion region on both of these right now, the reason that solid state power amps have very high power ratings like 100, 200, 400 watts a channel is because you want to stay away from distortion absolutely as much as possible. So to get the best dynamic range and highest headroom, you need tons of power just to stay out of the danger zone. Not so with a tube power amp. You actually can slide into a small amount of distortion uh, region in a tube power amp and get a very pleasing tone quality out of it. That's where you get into coloring the sound of a modeler. We're playing at a very low volume here, so we're not getting anywhere near the clipping region of either of these. So all you're going to be hearing is just the effect of playing dynamics and power amp behavior. So, having said all that, let's just get into it and we're going to plug into the uh, BGW first and listen to that. switch to the LX2, play the same thing. Okay, so you probably noticed that uh, the sound of the LX2 had a little bit more air, a little more sparkle, and sounded a little warmer on the bottom end. Again, there's, that's not any coloration due to tube characteristics or anything like that. That is strictly the domain of the interaction between the speaker cabinet and the power amp. On the BGW, you notice the sound was a little bit more square, more focused, and less lively. That's a typical characteristic of the solid state power amp. It's neutral, it's controlling the speaker behavior, and so the speaker is doing less, and it's actually the speaker that's coloring the sound. Okay, how does that relate to the behavior of the speaker sims in the uh, 11 rack, which by the way are turned off. All the effects are turned off in this except for a little bit of reverb, uh, the noise gate, um, uh, compression, any of those kinds of things that affect the dynamics are all turned off. The speaker sim is designed to emulate the, the curve, the frequency curve of a speaker cabinet um, in the modeler so that you can, uh, in effect, try different kinds of speaker cabinets with the different amps in the modeler and come up with a combination you like. Um, actually, speaker sims tend to be more frequency domain in a modeler where the actual speaker behavior is, is in the impedance curve domain. The impedance curve is how the impedance of the amplifier changes with the frequency that's going through the speaker. Speaker doesn't stay one impedance. It moves around with the frequency you play. And that's what makes a speaker do a little more or a little less on the upper or lower frequency. That impedance curve is a little harder to do in the digital domain. And that's why they tend to sound a little artificial. So me personally, I prefer to hear uh, a modeling unit through a real speaker cabinet and a tube power amplifier because that's genuine speaker reaction that you can actually feel under your fingers on the fretboard when you're playing guitar. The other thing about that, and we were talking about playing dynamics, is our natural inclination as guitar players when we feel like we want the amp to jump a little more is to smack on the strings. When we want to play lightly, uh, we want the guitar to sound responsive and have some clear harmonic sizzle and all that little sort of character on the top of the strings. Uh, if you don't have, um, if you don't have a good dynamic response, that stuff tends to get shaved off. And our first inclination, when that's not there, is to hit the strings harder to try to force it out. The exact opposite result is going to ensue. You're going to the harder you hit the guitar, the more you're going to compress the dynamics 
uh, using a solid state power amp and a, and a model speaker cabinet. And it's actually going to be harder to play the guitar because you're going to be digging at it, trying to get something out of there that isn't there. And it's even going further underground as you hit the guitar harder. And that's where a tube power amp really excels. So I'm going to play really lightly through, again, starting with the BGW, solid state power amp. And uh, then I'm going to play louder, and, sh and then I'm going to switch to the LX2 and do the same thing so you can see the different changes in behavior. Okay, so probably what you heard was when I'm playing the solid state power amp very lightly, uh, it did have um, a little bit of clarity and some nice harmonic response. Uh, and you notice on the upper strings, the mid range is where the uh, upper frequency feedback developing off the strings occurred, as opposed to the LX2. Um, when we played very lightly and then went up the strings, it was the upper harmonics that were starting to get into the feedback region. And then when I slammed on the chords on the Sol State power amp, the dynamics went away and I actually had to just slam on the strings a little harder to get some pick snap and uh, get some sustain. Whereas on the LX2, I was actually hitting the strings about half as hard and getting about twice as much out of it. So in this way, when you're playing in front of people, and you're trying to do a nice solo, the last thing you want to do is have this feeling of the guitar fighting you. You want it to feel like it's working with you, and that's where a solid state power, or a tube power amp really excels. Um, the models in a modeling preamplifier are very sophisticated, and there's a lot of deep uh, programming ability in these, and plus all the models and the effects. They're very convenient for pulling out just like all kinds of sounds, combinations of sounds, combinations of gear, and all the various tone settings. So, I mean, they're very useful and very powerful tools in the recording studio, in writing material, in producing uh, soundtracks and, and uh, TV commercials, and even in the live performance arena under a lot of circumstances. There are times when you're going to feel that you're encountering an artificial playing experience because of this lack of speaker response and harmonic balance and the uh, constriction of the playing dynamics. And that's where using a good quality neutral sounding or even enhanced sounding tube power amp is going to come into play. And I'm going to show you the enhanced version of the LX2 now. So I'm going to start by playing it in the flat mode like I have it now. And I'm going to switch to the enhanced mode so you can hear that. Okay, now what we've done is we've added a little bit of color to the power amp and it's actually enhanced the sound of the voicing of the modeling preamp and made it sound more like a real cranked amplifier. Um, that's not always going to be what you want to do in a recording studio perhaps, but in a live performance situation where you want to really feel the smack and feel like you're uh, emulating more of the, the feel and uh, uh, interaction of a real amplifier, it's going to be a real important feature to have and it's going to be a lot of fun using it. You'll actually feel, not only here, uh, the difference in the performance of the amplifier because not only affects the, the frequency balance of the, of the LX2, but it also affects the feedback, which opens that up a little bit. 
some of you are familiar with amplifiers that have very low levels or no feedback and that they have this sort of very organic open response. And uh, same thing is true here. So that's going to be really important. Um, again, going back to uh, the modelers, all of the ones that we've tried are very good at uh, their respective strengths. And um, the uh, 11 rack is just a very good one and you're going to get a lot of good use out of it. One of the things that we also found about playing into all the modelers is the interaction of the guitar into the input stage. And um, uh, we've got the guitar plugged straight into the input like you would normally do. And the input stage is a solid state buffer that conditions the signal before it goes to the uh, A to D converter, the analog to digital converter in, uh, that all modelers have. So. Um, that's another area where when you're smacking on the guitar, uh, that's another area in the, in the design of these things where you're going to find some uh, limitation in the dynamic response. And how we're going to address that is we're going to put our valvulator in the front. We talked about that earlier, that it's a tube buffer. And it's a unity gain. It doesn't add any gain. It doesn't add any signal level. It doesn't change the frequency response. It just changes the signal from high impedance to low impedance. What that means is that uh, the guitar is essentially plugged into a s input stage that you would normally encounter in a regular tube guitar amplifier. So uh, just by plugging into the valvulator, it's going to change and enhance the feel of the guitar and the, uh, the pick tack and the feel of the strings bouncing under your fingers. So putting that in front of the input uh, of the modeling unit will further enhance the quality of the playing experience. I'm going to switch the LX2 back to the flat mode, play a little bit with the uh, valvulator turned off as it has been so far this whole demo, and then I'm going to turn the valvulator on and you can hear how that is affecting things. So this is flat. <laughs> If you notice that I was playing with a little bit more enthusiasm, that was just simply a result of it was easier to play the guitar, and, I, and my fingers were lighter. I wasn't clutching the, the, the neck and the fretboard quite so hard, and that made it easier to um, rely on finger technique to do fun little things that were more difficult to do with the dynamics constricted going straight in. Um, most modeling preamps have some way to modulate the input stage to change the pickup loading, the pickup attack. I think the Kemper actually has a specific function for pick attack, which is very cool. And I believe that the uh, uh, Levin rack has a pickup loading function, which you're going to find really useful. And that's going to help sort of uh, improve upon that sort of character. And we haven't gotten into that that much. But uh, no matter what you do, putting uh, a valvulator in front of this and using this in a live performance venue is really going to enhance your performance and playing ability. So those are two really important things. And we'll be doing the same kind of a demo with the uh, Kemper profiling amplifier and the Line 6 Pod HD Pro. So um, this particular discussion covers all that really heavy duty geek stuff that, that um, your girlfriend goes out uh, with the rest of the girls for the night because she doesn't want to listen to and uh, um, it's pretty deep and I probably put half of you asleep already. That's to be expected. You're going to have to go through this a few times and see how it all works out. You'll see the next two videos, which will be much shorter. We'll just comp concentrate on the performance. Then you can go back and sort of absorb this over time and I think you'll find that it's going to be really useful. So thanks for putting up with me all this time and uh, come back and see us when we do the Kemper profiling demo and the Line 6 HD Pro demo. See you then. <laughs>